Thanks for taking the time to be interviewed by the American Physician Scientists Association about um, your recent paper in the MC Education about the first nationwide survey of MD PhDs in the social sciences and communities. Um, so if you could go around and introduce yourselves and where you are at. Yeah. I'm Helena Hansen. I'm at NYU in anthropology and uh, psychiatry. I'm Scott Stonington. I'm at the University of Michigan in anthropology and internal medicine. I'm Seth Holmes. I'm at Berkeley and UCSF in medical anthropology, the School of Public Health, and the School of Medicine. I'm Jeremy Green at Johns Hopkins. I'm a professor in the Department of Medicine in the Department of the History of Medicine. So can you tell us briefly what the study was about and sort of what the motivations were behind this study? Sure. So um, this is a piece that has been in the work for a long time, um, and partly in collaboration with Jen Carlin, who's not here, who's another author on it. And Diane Godhead. And Diane Godhead. Uh, and it was inspired by the beginning of the conferences that we are at right now, which are conferences for MD PhDs in social sciences and humanities. And when we first got this community together, we realized that it was essentially an invisible community in the broader world of physician scholars, physician scientists, and that most people who had been doing this work had been doing it um, of their own invention, somewhat quietly thinking of it as their own interests. Um, and so as we started to assemble it as a community with a coherent identity, we realized we needed to characterize who we were and how people had been doing this. And mostly structured around the fact that there are so few of us doing this that we might actually be able to do a totally different kind of statistics, meaning actually interview every single person who is part of this population um, and describe it rather than have to use des descriptive statistics to come to some kind of understanding of it. I think that's a good summary. Yeah. So I think with the birth of APSA in the early 2000s, 2005. 2005, so around the same, the, the same time that we started doing this research project. And APSA was the first nationwide MD-PhD group that included social science and humanities relatively explicitly. I think we got interested in finding out what the experiences of trainees had been in terms of how their training was integrated, how they experienced it, whether they had funding and explicit support from a program or not and how that affected them and then what they were doing in their careers later. Partially so we could compare MD-PhDs in the social sciences with MD-PhDs in the kind of more traditional basic sciences and understand where we fit in that process. In the early 2000s there had been a few highly publicized calls in top medical journals for accounting of the funding for MD-PhDs, both uh, through the Medical Scientist Training Program and other sorts of public funding from NIH, and wanting to make sure that MD-PhDs were doing something that was called the triple threat at the time, where they're doing clinical work, teaching, and research that was mutually informative. And so part of our project was looking at that as well. How does MD-PhDs in social sciences and humanities do in relation to that? And what did you find from this type of Yeah, yeah. so, so um, you know, many, many of the findings um, are interestingly complicated by a generation because this has been a, a very recently emerging field. Um, but one thing that has been consistent and interesting is that the scholars in the social sciences and humanities end up picking different clinical fields than their basic science counterparts. Um, and I think our, our, our data shows this to a good degree, and the gestalt of it is that I think a lot of basic science and the PhDs end up picking subspecialties and are often encouraged to do so, partly to limit their clinical scope so they're not so overwhelmed, is my understanding. Um, whereas in the social sciences and humanities, people are picking much more generalist fields. Um, primary care, general medicine, pediatrics, family medicine, psychiatry. psychiatry. Um, and I think that is also due to the demands of those academic disciplines, which um, are about broad social questions that are much more generalist in nature than they are um, specialized. So it's really finding a, a specialty area that fits in with the research in the universe. Yes. A couple other findings were that 
many more of us major or minor in social sciences or humanities as undergrads and not just in the basic sciences in the traditional pre-med way and um, more of us are doing research and fit the triple threat model than the general MD PhD um, population nationwide. So very few of us go into private practice, whereas I think 15 or so percent of MD PhDs nationwide go into private practice without doing research. Um, and some of us end up in positions that are interesting and unique and not exactly triple threat, but working at the World Health Organization or the CDC or the Smithsonian or something like that, um, where in a certain way their clinical background and their research are coming together in a leadership capacity. And if I could comment on that for a moment, so I think this is one of the interesting findings of your paper, that, that as you see a number of medical students coming into medical school with social science and humanities backgrounds, partly because there's been broad shifts in medical school admissions towards encouraging this more well-rounded uh, incoming class of medical students. It shouldn't surprise us that we see an increase in number of these students wanting to actually pursue rigorous scholarship in these areas, just as earlier cohorts of medical students who had traditionally been trained more in basic sciences wanted to pursue more rigorous investigation in those areas. I think the growth of this area, which this conference that we're all at is really, in many ways, both the support structure and the celebration of, uh, speaks of broad shifts in medical education. So, in a way, it's an embodiment, as you're suggesting, of the original MSTP program, but with a new change in focus of medical students with new undergraduate backgrounds and scholarly interests. Yeah, I think that's so well put, and I may comment too. I, I actually wasn't an author on the paper, but I may have been among the first to disseminate the paper. And uh, the person that I shared it with was the director of extramural affairs at NIH, Michael Lauer, who had assembled a group of MD PhDs to brainstorm and troubleshoot around the fact that fewer and fewer of them are staying in academic medicine. And so I was able to share this paper to, um, to really ground something that a lot of MD-PhD directors of programs that welcome social science and humanities um, had said to me that MD-PhDs in social science and humanities are actually more likely to stay in academic medicine and to do research as part of their career moving forward than bench scientists, clinical trials, trained researchers. So uh, I just I, I say that just to congratulate you on the importance of this paper. It is so important to give those of us who are not close to uh, the MDPHD, MDPhD track in social science and, human, and medicine, um, social science and humanities, um, a view of what the what the return is on the investment. And it's it's impressive what programs that have cobbled together funding from many different sources in order to support this unusual track, um, what they've made possible and what they're getting back in the form of a whole cohort of jointly trained people who are really making substantial changes in academic medicine and clinical practice. So you mentioned that um, the cohort you're tracking went through MD PhD programs as well as through other training um, programs or on their own, as you say. Can you tell us a little bit more about the various pathways people took and sort of what that breakdown looks like? Yeah, one of the things that was uh, funnest for us and also a little bit surprising was the diversity of paths that people have taken. And I think that is also in comparison to the general PhD population. Some of that is because it's only in the early, starting in the early 2000s that a lot of these programs have become formalized. So people who did this pathway, if we can even call it that, um, prior to that often cobbled it together in different ways. And so some people got their MD first, some people got their PhD first, and some people took time off themselves, and some people incorporated it in the PhD in their residency. And it was really, you know, it, in, in our paper, it looks like a salad bar of options, of, of, of possibilities, but I think it's not so true for the basic science and PhD population. That is now changing quite a lot as um, almost like wildfire programs are starting to, to um, formalize this and create programs. So you know, at the beginning when we founded the organization that's meeting here, 
there were only a handful of programs that officially supported social sciences and their PhDs, and I think now it's in their 20s, that have uh, formal combined programs that look like NSTP or some, some variant of that. So we're again seeing a big cohort effect that um, we'll have a new group of people who are trained in a much more uh, narrow set of structures. We hope someone will do a similar kind of follow-up study of what's been happening since the research we did mm -hmm. on upcoming cohorts, partially because there are more people going through formal programs to find out how that affects people, but also the de demographics of the trainees has changed. So in our research, um, among all the cohorts before 2000, I, if I remember correctly, very few were women. Something like a quarter of the trainees were women, and here at this conference you see that that's shifted dramatically, much more toward parity, if not perhaps a more women than men. So. And certainly since the first time I attended this conference, it certainly has grown quite a bit over the years. Um, what do you attribute are the major factors that contributes to the increased number of people training in this pathway over this time period? I think there are a few reasons. One is that people have heard of someone who's done it. Um, there are those first generations published books and became faculty members and then other people kind of heard of that as an option and they could imagine it. Um, one is that we, I don't, I'm not a historian so you may argue with me, but I'll argue in, in a certain <laughs> sense, I mean your job is always to say that's not new. <laughs> in a certain sense it seems to me that we are in medicine and global health and public health many of us are becoming aware or have become aware of the ways in which the medical technologies that we're producing and taking to cure sickness um, are not working because of the political, economic, historical, social structures in which they're embedded. And so more people who want to help the world be more equal, be more just, be more healthy, and help they want to work with structurally vulnerable populations who um, are experiencing sickness and injury in um, kind of higher than average ways. Um, they're realizing that we need history, we need anthropology, we need sociology, we need ethics, we need classics, we need to think in this broad social science and humanities way. Um, and then I think there are a few people who have become public scholars in a sense. You know, the Paul Farmers or Jim Kims or um, oh, the recent president of the APHA. Oh, yes. He's an amazing MD, PhD. Um, but there are a few people who have become famous in the public eye who then people hear, oh, they did an MD, PhD, or they're a physician scholar, that's interesting. I mean, I, I would, I'm actually not going to disagree with that. <laughs> I, I think that you, know, you could say that there has always been a dimension of social science and humanities and medical education and of the definition of physician scholars. And you know, even here at Harvard Medical School, where we're sitting today, uh, there's been a, a long history of the Department of Social Medicine, which has, in some ways, been historically on, on the margins of medical education, but it's increasingly moved centrally into the core of what is expected to come out of training in four years in medical school. And so I want to say, beyond just MD, PhD populations, I think the medical students that I get to work with every year I think are increasingly engaged in social <coughs> questions. They they recognize intuitively. I don't have to. I don't have to convert. I don't have to spend a lot of effort working with medical students to talk about the inescapable social basis of diagnosis and therapeutic practice. And I think it's a very different position than it was when I started medical school um, 20 years ago. Um, and so I, I think that that. Why are there so many people at this conference really comes on some level in a transformation of the recognition that the social dimensions of, of medical care are key to actually, even if we're just talking about innovating more effective solutions and delivery, let alone maintaining the system that we have. And so I think the enthusiasm builds across the medical school base. I think the MD PhD students that we work with feel that their questions are resonant and important with their peer classmates in medical school, and likewise in arts and sciences campuses, where the crisis of the humanities, crisis of the social sciences that we've all been talking about, mm -hmm. uh, finding tangible manifestation in the kinds of translational work that can be done by scholars. 
I have to agree with you about the, the generational differences. <clears throat> and um, one thing that I found in interviewing people who teach political cultural topics and um, psychiatry programs is that there's this trickle up effect of um, people who are doing this work often having started as trainees. And I think actually all of us to some degree did that. We started our work uh, as academic. Um, educators when we were still trainees and um, th that may always be the case the trainees are a little bit ahead of, of um, their attendings or their um, their educating um, uh, role models um, <clears throat> but I also wanted to say that I, what we see here is an institutionalization for support for the people that are now coming in having been anthropology majors, history majors, sociology majors. Um, in that, another danger is that people have that kind of focus and enthusiasm taken out of them in the course of clinical training when they don't have institutional support from faculty members like us. So uh, I think it's important not to lose sight of the, the two ends of this whole, that, um, that both need to move forward in concert to make sure that we keep social medicine at the center of what happens in academic um, academic training. And one, one thing I'll add to that is that one of the things that I was struck by most as I moved through my clinical training after my PhD, so in my PhD I did medical school, and then first two years of medical school, then the full PhD, and then the rest of medical school and residency. So the bulk of my clinical experiences have been post-anthropology PhD, and I came in with this assumption that the world of medicine would be full of people who respect only basic science ways of viewing the world and um, only quantitative ways of understanding how uh, questions get answered and put together. Um, and instead I found this almost desperate hunger <laughs> among clinicians for some, of, for some concrete tools to grab onto to work with the social world because I think most clinicians the diagnostic, therapeutic parts of what they do uh, quickly become routine and sublimated and um, <coughs> become competent at them. And this is where the word competency has been so powerful in this realm. And the thing that frustrates them every day in their clinical practice is the social world. So I think there's also been this, this groundswell as tools start to become more and more available and people get hungrier for them. You know, the, the talks that people are getting that provide some tools for the, how to interface with the social world are interesting and useful. And so there's, there's a little bit of um, not just structural programmatic stuff, but um, I think people having a, a need and it's starting to be met by this community. What do you think are some of the major challenges facing current trainees and ongoing as physician scholars or as they transition into uh, young faculty? Positions. Well, there's so many. <laughs> I mean, I think we can start out by talking about some of the unique challenges to being an MPH trainee in a humanity and social science program as opposed to a basic science, which is there's logistical problems having to do even with the chronology of board certification programs for PhD programs that take longer. Sometimes there's there's a, there's dissonances between what it means to um, actually be doing research and actually work with an institutional review board. And, and there can be places in which an MD-PhD trainee in humanity and social science will encounter friction on tracks that have already been well greased for a basic science mm -hmm. PhD student. That's not an intentional instructionism, it's just having to think categorically about what this kind of work is. I think there's also, uh, like any MD PhD training, there's the challenges of moving back and forth and balancing. Re recognizing at certain points in your life you're dominantly pursuing clinical training, but you're keeping up an identity as a scholar. At other points, you're dominantly pursuing your scholarship and your PhD, you're trying to keep a toe in the clinical world. That kind of seesawing back and forth can be difficult, requires strategies. Um, but then there's more specific things that happen on the way out as well. So part of what we'll be doing uh, later today and tomorrow is some of the panels will be on career pathways. There's no clear career pathway. The, the models to creating a sustainable, funded job within academia um, are, are, are not, even when one person finds a way to do it, it's not reproducible. So it requires a lot of flexibility, opportunism, entrepreneurship in order to find positions for oneself on the way out of the program. And I think here today there's 
there's so many people who show how many pathways one can successfully pursue this, and yet all of us still feel like, even the four of us are still feeling on a general basis, how do we, what's that next step? How do we, how do we make sure, and as we, tra as we transition towards being mentors and, and training our own trainees right now, how do we make sure that there's pathways for them to move forward out of these programs as well? Yeah, and I, I want to point out one thing about that, that the, the challenges that Jeremy just listed, many of them are structural. And I think it's interesting to point out that there are some ways in which doing a MD, PhD in the social sciences and humanities is easier. And there are there are fewer barriers than for a basic science PhD, which is that you know as I was moving through an MSDP program and as I have continued to mentor in in our MSDP program, there for basic scientists I think there's a really can be a very challenging cognitive dissonance um, that they have to hold where this moving back and forth is not just structural but you know how do you teach a basic cellular immunology class in an undergrad setting, or, and then go to your lab where your model is maybe not even mammal organisms, and then you go to your clinic, um, that gets, gets more and more tense as the clinical work gets more stressful and more productivity oriented, and the world of research gets more stressful and more grant oriented with less funding. So I think that, that some of that um, is resolved a little bit by the social sciences and humanities where the, the connection between clinical work and research can be much uh, closer and more intimate. So for example, I'm, you know, I give a lecture course on global health and half of what I talk about is my clinical practice and my hands-on care in other places. Um, and then the same is true in clinic every day. I'm, you know, I just wish I had more time to go home with every patient because they all you know, feel like this great source of, of information for me. So there's, you know, there's some balance, and I think some of those things are, are, are a bit of why we're seeing more and more social science communities, PhD students, as that is um, more of an option for people. Uh, they, some, some people find that they're able to a little bit less cognitive science. Translation, yeah. Translational social science is so unique. Yeah. yeah. I find that exactly every day, any setting that I'm in, I find that translating between the worlds, it, there's there's so many concrete things I can match up to my clinic that relates to my research and my research that relates to my clinic in ways I feel it can be much harder for this. Yeah, I think you really put your finger on something, and in follow up studies, maybe um, you could delve a little deeper yeah. into the reasons why social science and humanities and PhDs tend to stay in academia, and part of it may be, for instance, why it's harder for us perhaps to get certain kinds of grants funding, such as NIH funding, and definitely harder for us to get enormous grants, um, which are the standards by which most medical centers evaluate researchers and scholars and faculty. At the same time, we are, we are cheap. <laughs> we have very small startup costs. We can use our clinics as ethnographic field sites. In a lot of cases, I know I have. Um, and so when for instance, NIH funding gets very difficult, like it is right now, across the board 10% cuts to institutes. Um, I have a lot of different ways that I can keep my research projects going. My neuroimaging colleagues are really screwed because they need a minimum a million dollars or two million dollars to even get their shop going. So there are certainly advantages and disadvantages structurally to the kind of work that we do. And it may be that our flexibility and our diverse um, approaches to gathering data are something that make it a little bit easier to stay engaged in research and academic medicine when the structures that be are, um, are making it more difficult to keep research projects going for bench science colleagues. And this survey does reflect that. So we had a sec segment of it where we got to ask people to evaluate their training path and their careers. And we were pleased by how many people said that their research and clinical practice are a synergy and that there's not a lot of dissonance there. Whereas I think in a lot of the basic science and PhDs, that remains a huge tension throughout people's careers trying to, to make those comments real. What do you think are some tangible ways that we can better support them? Well, one thing that, that could be done is to help to coordinate the application process for the PhD programs mm -hmm. in humanities and social sciences within MSD programs across the board. So for the applicant looking at the program, and certainly I think for our generation, it was entirely uneven. 
this involves a lot of different applications to different departments, to different programs. I, I know individual schools are working to streamline so that there is an MSDP program and that social science and humanities are flagged within that common kind of application, although it's not true everywhere. I think having that visible across the board, across the new PhD training programs, is really helpful. Um, of course, I think, I, I think part of the problem of funding long term. Right, is is a uh, it's incumbent on us to make the case for funding, to make the case for funding, and both public and and uh, foundation and, and and private donors. So I think the work of actually developing a base for funding to support the research and support the trainee programs. It, it's not just simply for us to complain that the NIH doesn't offer trainee grants in social science. I think they 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 can and they do, and we have to work to actually build that. That platform. So I think that's, that's a challenge for us, and I'd say a more broader viewership looking at, at, at the setting of comments. I think how do we take these encouraging results and actually work to build structures to help fund these, these partners that want to That's well said, and I guess I would add to that something that came out of the last session of this conference that it seems empty PhD programs are limited to a very small kind of elite group. Um, and the conversation headed towards, well, how can we expand this model to other medical centers that actually do have social science and humanities departments um, associated with them? Probably one of the big um, problems we tackle is funding to make it more transparent and easier for medical schools to put together a funding package and to collaborate with social science and humanities programs that probably also have resources to support PhD students that are doing joint training. But I think it's a really good, great question, and we should be planting faculty members, <laughs> such as the people at this conference, more widely to a broader group of medical schools. So this is something that um, this kind of scholarship and interdisciplinary um, cross pollination is something that all medical centers can benefit from, and certainly centers in parts of the country that have fewer of these elite. Programs such as on the South, the mid, certain parts of the Midwest, they are encountering the very structural problems that our research is geared to address. So we, we want to bring them along. You know, within the social sciences and humanities, are there specific disciplines that you feel like we need more physical scholars in that is currently lacking right now? Are you trying to get us to fight amongst <laughs> <laughs> In the research, we tried to focus on what you some places would call kind of the basic science fields in the social sciences and humanities, as opposed to health services research or public health or maybe health policy or health economics, because those fields already have strong support and strong funding, often from medical centers. Although there is some of that in the research, but. Um, we were trying to aim more towards anthropology, sociology, history, English, philosophy, classics, literature, any kind of um, the basic disciplines to see what happens when people train in those things that, you know, when I tell new people I'm meeting or when I was first telling my family I'm going to do an MD and a PhD in anthropology, they all think, oh, that's a weird combination. Why are you doing those two? Whereas I think if you said public health or health services research or health policy, no one would question it, or immunology or another kind of basic science. So that's what we're trying to highlight. Um, and I would love it if we had more of all of that. Some of my colleagues in the fields that uh, perhaps didn't occur to me at the beginning of this process are really doing interesting work, like geography, mm -hmm. urbanism, media studies, uh, so it would be really exciting to see those kinds of fields um, begin to be seeded with, um, with joint training programs. And, uh, at least students who can lead the way in bringing faculty together that no, don't normally have much to do with each other. The really exciting work has come out of some of those fields, more recent, recently developing fields. One thing to say about this is that <clears throat> one of the points of the MD PhD program is to give people competence in skills and methodologies and ways of thinking about knowledge generation that are very different from one another and that are also different from those expected as the skill set of physicians already. So I think that people who are 
um, doing PhDs in public health, for example, and learning to learn clinical trials, etc. That's a fabulous set of skills and very useful, but doesn't quite fit this model of the tension, the moving back and forth between worlds that don't usually talk to one another. Um, so I think that's a little bit of what we were trying to trying to emphasize because it is one of the stated goals of MD PhD training overall. And I would emphasize you know the importance of basic sciences. I think that there are basic social sciences. And although colleagues in the humanities might cringe at having humanity called basic science, <laughs> there still is a similar kind of, of logic. I mean one of the one of the trainees at this conference is just completing an MD-PhD in classics right? She's going to be a radiologist. And proscriptively, you would not put these things together. Perhaps you would. But, but the way that she put them together is uniquely revelatory to both fields. There's a very clear reason that she can use the field of radiology to contribute a new way to start radiology and actually re examining classical medicine and classical illness and classical ancient period, right? And at the same time, you use a study of changing ways of visualizing and conceptualizing this insight, actually feedback on what the work of the radiologist is and trying to actually call disease in the clinic. So, in other words, it takes any of these trainees to produce the justification for bringing the fields together. I think what's key is an element to a, a spirit of basic science inquiry, which I think you agree is there in that project I just described, even though the basic science in question is classics. Right? Um, and also, the Something else just to reinforce is this importance of interdisciplinarity. I think that all of us certainly benefited from this conversation between the fields that we were trained in our disciplines, right? And it's an effortless process. So that that that, that the the space in which investigations from geography, history, media studies, anthropology, sociology actually have to produce and propel more questions for scholars and sources and this, I think helps to define Something that, that, that puts these fields together. So I, you know, I'm not going to bring on my partner and historian part and say more history here. What I, what I want to argue is that the spirit of a basic social science, basic science approach to thinking about how the humanities and social science provide critical insights into that and can translate that in a way aren't captured in perhaps what we already accept as um, acceptable quantitative social sciences, which we know there's a grant base for and tracks for. It's, it, this, these are kinds of, um, of vital zones of inquiry for these purposes. And then, to those who are uninitiated to the social sciences and you know, potential trainees who are you know, coming to the pipeline or people who are thinking about supporting this pipeline into funding or starting at a school, what would you say is the strongest value proposition you have to support position scholars and training scholars? I think if we want a healthy world, if we want people to be healthy, then we need to understand the historical, political, economic, social, cultural aspects of sickness, of injury, of disease, of health, of healthcare, of the production of technologies for health, of the interactions between physicians, nurses, physical therapists, patients. Um, why the patients are getting sick in the first place, how that relates to the social categories they belong to, the racialization of those categories, the histories of colonization that lead to that, um, as well as why physicians, for example, are leaving clinical practice more and more. Where does that come from? What are the social, economic, political drivers of that? So I think if we want a healthy, world, a healthy society, or even a healthy healthcare system, then we need to understand this. And um, one way to do that is to have, have people who are trained in understanding those aspects and understanding medicine and disease and injury together, trying to put them together. I, think that I, I can't think of very many other things that I would say are as important for the future of the Earth. <laughs> And I, there's a the disjuncture between our investment in innovation and our ability to realize the benefits of these innovations. Now, medicine, academic medicine in 21st century America is going to continue to prioritize innovation. I'm not suggesting that innovation is, is a false goal, but if we really 
want to see a continued support for our healthcare system, right? If we want to see the true potential of medical science be realized in the American public, we need to invest more in this translation mechanism, so understanding where it is that this falls short. We passed the 21st Century Cures Act last December, and when we do such a poor job of delivering the 20th century cures we have, we have. So, so I would argue that these sorts of social scientific and humanistic and racist suggesting in part essentially that this research is required in order to actually uh, deliver on the value of uh, American medicine as it's promised. And are you planning any follow-up studies to this, this study that you just published? And what are your future plans? Well, I, I in a way, think of the study as a, as a pilot because it was opportunistic and we had this old survey mechanism and the population was just coming into being and now it is a whole different entity. So I think um, now is the time to do the real survey with a lot more detail and that sort of thing. So um, I think we're hoping to find a team to help us do that. <laughs> Rather than do it ourselves. Yeah. It's also been interesting partially as this research has been going, certain um, faculty and staff involved with the AAMC have gotten especially more and more interested in it. And so I think they're now specifically tracking in PhDs in the social sciences and humanities in their nationwide research also. Um, but I think we do hope that within this conference there might form a team that wants to do a more detailed follow-up because our study followed the first cohorts and now we'd love to know what's been happening since then.